Eight o'clock is awake today. Grace Church, yeah, welcome. I'm glad that you're here. You can sit down for just a second. Uh, got, a, got a couple of things I want to talk to you about. Uh, first of all, if you are new or newish to Grace, we have an opportunity called Step In, uh, which is a time where you can meet uh, part of the staff and part of the elders. Uh, you can hear about us, who we are, what we do, why we do what we do, and why we do it the way that we do it, and give you an opportunity to ask any questions that you have about us. And so that Step In opportunity is for you. Um, and it's April the 28th at the 915 service. So uh, if that's something that you're interested in, there is a next step card uh, that you can fill out and let us know or just go to the orange balloons in the commons area and we'll sign you up for that class. And speaking of that card, uh, 
Be, in, the, in the seat backs in front of you uh, are several cards and an envelope that I just want to point out. If you have a prayer concern, if you would fill that card out, let us know what we can pray for on your behalf. We would love to do that. If you have a next step, if you're interested in one of our opportunities, this card is for you. And if you are new, we just want to know that you're here. Uh, if you would fill that out, take any of those cards to the orange balloons in the comments area. This is our way of responding to you with whatever needs a request that you might have. And then the giving envelope is for your use as well. Uh, you can uh, put that in the giving box on your way out of the auditorium or on your way out of the building. There are two black boxes uh, that you can put this envelope in. Take the cards to the orange balloons uh, in the commons area. And then one other thing, ladies, uh, we have the well coming up on May the 4th from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. This is a time for you to get together, uh, share a time of worship, instruction, and fellowship. Uh, please keep that in mind, May the 4th from 9 to 11 in the morning. Uh, can I pray for us uh, this morning? Uh, we want to give God this service. We want to open our hearts and our minds to what God has for us. We are in the second episode of this series, Future Family, talking about what it means to be a family honoring God. Uh, so let's go to God uh, on our behalf. Father, we thank you uh, that you are in this place. We thank you, Father, that you love us. We thank you uh, that you have given us life uh, in Jesus, and we have come uh, to praise his name. So, Father, receive our worship from children who love you. And we pray, Father, that we would have open hearts and minds to receive your teaching for us today, that you would guide us in everything that we do and say, that we would honor you with our families. We give it to you, Father, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, let's stand together. Let's continue our worship.
to the wonder of a king, to the nearness of a friend. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful Jesus, how lovely, how sweet.
Jesus, my Jesus. Lord, we lift you up this morning. Your name is beautiful. Your name is powerful. Your name alone, Jesus. So, Jesus, we trust in you today. I thank you, Lord, that I've got breath in my lungs. I thank you that we've got breath in our lungs today, God. I thank you that we can come together this morning as the body of Christ and worship you. I pray this morning for Tyler's message. I pray that you give us ears to hear, God. So we trust in you and we thank you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, Grace. How are you guys all doing this morning? Yeah. So today we are going to continue our series about family by diving into some of the struggles or challenges that we face. You know, we just started that intentional parenting class this week, and I will say that it was really heartwarming to see so many people come, because it doesn't really matter at what stage of parenting or life that you're in, it's not easy. And it's especially not easy if we feel that we're in it alone. So seeing such a large group of you guys come together from all different age ranges and stages of life, that was just really cool. It's something that we all need. It's something we could all benefit from because we all struggle. And I know, I know that my struggles are likely different than your struggles, and your struggles might even be different than your spouse's struggles. I mean, maybe your spouse is your struggle. <laughs> but honestly, I think that one of the harder parts of parenting or leading a family is admitting that we struggle at all. But there is no such thing as a perfect parent. There is no such thing as a perfect family. There isn't like a manual or a book to teach us how to perfectly raise a child or lead others. However, the Bible does give us a bit of a blueprint. The Bible gives us some instructions that should actually help us. In fact, I'll have all of you guys stand up right now as we read um, some of those instructions from Deuteronomy 6. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all of his statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life, and that all your days may be long. Now hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You guys may be seated. Now, every time that I read this, I see what appears to be very clear biblical instruction on what we're commanded to do ourselves, as well as how to raise our children or to lead our families down the spiritual path that God sets out for us. Now, I say that, yeah, I know that I'm not great at fully following these commands, and I know that I don't think that I'm alone in that. So, which begs the question, why is parenting so hard? I mean, I know that I love God with my heart, soul, and might. I talk about God with my kids. We pray together. We worship together. And I'm sure a lot of you do these things too. So what's missing? Why, after hundreds of generations, do we still struggle to get this thing right? So let's go back to Deuteronomy 6 for a minute. Was there anything that spoke to you when you heard that? Because I noticed a couple of words that really caught my attention and got me thinking. And one of those words was the word, diligently. Now, I understood what that word meant on a basic level, so I decided to take a deeper dive into the word because there's obviously something I'm still missing. So when I looked at the definition of diligently, I saw two different things. One was great or constant activity, and two, with great effort or determination. So then I look at the synonyms, and those were interesting too. Carefully, closely, intensely, exhaustively, thoroughly, persistently. Do you kind of see where I'm going with this? 
Now, the other word that kept catching my attention as I read this passage was the word all from verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Now, I know what the word all means, but I decided to look up the definition anyways, and it says this, the whole quantity or extent of a particular thing. So to give a different perspective, if you eat all of a pizza, how much is left over? Well, there's nothing left over. <laughs> and if you do all of the dishes, I mean, there's not still some dirty fork laying around somewhere in the sink. And if you finish all of the laundry, well, I'll let you tell me what that's like, because I don't know. <laughs> so how do we follow these commands that God has given us? How do we follow God's path for our lives and our fa family's lives? It's really quite simple. Now, I'm not saying that it's easy, but the concepts are simple, and we're all capable of taking these steps. The first of which is, love the Lord with all of your heart, soul, and might. But this means that if you do this, there's nothing left over. You won't be giving part of your heart or soul to other things like money or status or politics or bad habits, sports, work, or anything else. Because if you love the Lord with all of your heart, soul, and might, there's just nothing left to give to the things of this world. And secondly, teach these commands diligently to your children and to others, meaning persistently, thoroughly, exhaustively, carefully, closely, intensely, passionately, nonstop. Let me put it this way. Is it good enough to just read and explain God's commands to your children one time or even just every once in a while? Well, if your answer is yes, then just go back and read the book of Judges and you might second-guess yourself there. In the book of Judges, the Israelites were already brought into the promised land. God has worked miracles upon, upon miracles in their lives. But once they were there, they began to be ruled by different judges, as they were called. Some of them followed God and others did not. So when they were ruled or led by the judges that didn't follow God, nobody was teaching them about God anymore. Eventually, they kind of started to forget about him and started to follow their own ways. Also, just hearing about God's commands might not be good enough. Some of you or your children might consider yourselves as uh, visual learners. This means that we have to model the following of these commands as well for our children and families to learn. Now, there's this old adage that I used to hear my own dad say all the time, do what I say, not as I do. Have any of you ever heard that? When has that ever worked? It doesn't. It doesn't make sense. It's not really that fair. I mean, from a kid's perspective, why would I have wanted to listen to my dad when it was clear that this value or action or behavior or whatever it was, wasn't that important to him? We must teach and model these commands diligently, all the time, exhaustively, carefully, even passionately because you actually care about them, because you love the Lord with all of your heart, soul, and might. Now, like I said, this isn't necessarily easy, and I want to talk about why, as there's some hurdles that we all seem to face that seem to get in our way, and those hurdles are our past. And I don't even mean just our past personally, but think about the past of your parents, and their parents, and their parents' parents. You all have your own hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Well, so do your parents, and their parents, and theirs. You see, our present is shaped by our past, which in turn influences our future. Who you are today is shaped by who you came from, where you came from, the environment and culture of your family through multiple generations. There is a cause and effect relationship between you and your family of origin, and this is where the concept of generational sin comes into play. Now, what is generational sin? It's weaknesses or tendencies or patterns that are handed down to us through the generations from parents or family members or, yeah, members of our family. Now, have you ever considered the sins or sin patterns from people in the Bible? Maybe someone who we call to be a hero of our faith, even? Well, let's talk about it. Ever heard of Father Abraham? Yeah, he was broken, and he had a broken family, too. So we're going to start in Genesis 12, verse 10 which says this. Now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. And then they'll kill me, but they will let you live. 
So say that you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life will be spared for your sake. So she listened to him, and she did just that. Pharaoh then took Sarah because of how beautiful she was and ended up giving Abraham a bunch of wealth in exchange for his sister. So wait, Abraham lied. He put Sarah's life at risk to save his own life, and then he got a bunch of wealth in the process. I mean, some guy that he is. And I haven't even mentioned the fact that he had a mistress whom he had a baby with, who he then banished from his family once he had a son with his wife. And of course, that's not all. Pay attention to what happens in chapter 20. They continued to journey on and ended up in a place called Gerar, where Abraham had the same fears that he had when they entered Egypt. So naturally, he told their king, Abimelech, that Sarah was his sister. Again. So Abimelech took Sarah until he found out that she was Abraham's wife. So he angrily returned Sarah and gave Abraham a bunch of wealth and some land so that the king may be spared by God. Do you notice a pattern starting at all? And I wish it ended there, but it didn't. Genesis 26 tells us about how Abraham, Abraham had his son Isaac, who then got married to Rebekah, and then there was a famine in the land. I wonder what's coming next. Isaac then traveled to a land of Gerar and came to King Abimelech and his men. Well, that sounds eerily familiar. So then the men asked Isaac about Rebekah, and well, Isaac got scared scared that the men would kill him if they found out that she was his wife because of how beautiful she was. Here we go again. So he told them that she was his sister. I wonder where he got this idea from. Daddy did it first. Can you guys relate to that at all? I know that I can and in so many ways. Like growing up, my dad worked so many hours that most weeks we barely saw him. And he always justified it by saying that it was necessary in order to take care of and provide for the family, which I always felt was understandable. So naturally, I get older, become a dad myself, and I begin telling myself the same things. So I started working like 60 or 70 hour work weeks most of the time so I can take care of and provide for my family. But I wasn't really there. And then there was also the way that I witnessed my parents deal with their anger, as well as so many other things, but more on that in a little bit. Is any of this starting to sound like a familiar story to you? Back to Abraham. There was so much selfishness and deception running in this family. And guess what? There's more, of course. Abraham's son Isaac had two sons of his own, Esau and Jacob. Though they were twins, Esau was born first, meaning that he would be in line for his father's inheritance and blessing. And Esau was favored by Isaac. I mean, he was strong, hairy, hunter, you know, like a man's man. But Rebekah favored Jacob. He's her baby. So one day, after Isaac had started to lose his sight and felt that he was near death, he sends Esau out to go hunt so, he can, so Isaac could eat and offer his blessing to Esau. But Rebekah had other plans. She knew that Esau would be gone for a little while, so she quickly tells Jacob, just hurry, go bring a couple of the goats in. I'll prepare them. We'll feed them to him, and he'll give you Esau's blessing instead as long as you pretend to be Esau, which is exactly what happens. More lies more deception. The pattern continues from generation to generation, and it's still not done. It's only getting worse. Jacob left, and he had 12 sons from four different women. Things are getting a little out of control. And remember how Isaac had a favorite child in Esau, and Rebekah showed favoritism to Jacob? Well, guess what? Jacob ended up having a favorite wife, who gave birth to his favorite son, whose name was Joseph. So he played favorites too, because, you know, he saw how well that worked out for them last time. But imagine how his other wives and sons would have felt. Actually, I'll just tell you, Joseph's brothers hated Joseph so much, they couldn't stand him. They conspired to kill him off. But instead of doing that, they settled for selling him to some slave traders so they could at least make a little bit of money to make it all worth it. And that way they didn't have to get their hands dirty in the process. So once again... We see this family giving up a relative by lying and gaining some wealth for their troubles. And then they just went on and lied some more by telling their dad that Joseph was killed by some sort of wild animal. This family is full of liars and cheats. Now, we just went through four generations of this destructive pattern of sin that just seems to be getting passed down. Four generations full of deceit, of abuse, favoritism, infidelity, and destructive sibling rivalry. 
generational sin is a very real and a very powerful struggle. And do you ever have the thoughts of, how could God be so good to me because I'm not so good to him? Or I'm constantly falling short as a parent, as a spouse, as a follower of Jesus, so why would he show love to me? Because guys, I just want you to remember for a second that despite all of this, God blesses this family. But he does warn us of these consequences because our actions, our words, our behaviors, they have a true generational impact. Now Exodus 34 says this, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of their parents to the third and fourth generation. Now, I know that might sound confusing, as it seems to say that God is punishing you and me for something that great-great-grandpa did. And that doesn't seem right. I mean, that doesn't seem to line up with the God that we claim to know, right? But there's actually many layers to this. So what is it really saying? Well, one, it's saying that apparent sin has generational consequences. Think about this. In the case of, like, infidelity or abuse or maybe even another reason that ends in divorce, for example, who ends up paying the price for the family structure falling apart even though they didn't have any part in making the decision? The kids or the grandkids. They're all affected. They're left to pick up the pieces left behind, so to speak. They deal with the emotional pain, the trust issues, possessiveness, pessimism, feeling of abandonment, confusion, insecurity, maybe even a fear of commitment or a lack of taking marriage seriously later in their own life. When parents sin, it's the next few generations that end up being collateral damage. In James Dobson's book titled Love Must Be Tough, he says, the most vulnerable victims of family instability are the children who are too young to understand what has happened to their parents. Parent sin has consequences from generation to generation to generation. And another layer is that sin runs in the family. And I'm not necessarily talking in terms of sin is actually in our blood or anything like that, but we tend to be influenced by what we see, and then we copy that behavior. Not even intentionally all the time. I remember growing up watching my parents handle their anger in an unhealthy and sometimes destructive way. I remember telling myself, I never want to be like that. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to learn how to healthily release anger or just avoid being angry at all so that my kids don't end up with the same memories that I had. Have you ever said anything like that? That you're going to do better than your parents did, but then reality sets in and all of a sudden you start to sound just like them? then you might understand the shame that I felt the moment that I first kicked a toy out of anger or unhealthily raised my voice at this little two- or three-year-old girl and my child who really didn't do anything wrong but was a victim to my lack of self-care and the pressure of the world weighing down on my shoulders. I was starting to become like my parents. And I wish it ended there too, but it didn't. And guess what she did as time went by and she became angry or didn't like something that we had to say. I'm telling you, the first time that she screamed back at me or when I first saw her kick one of her own toys when she got angry, I was broken because I knew the cycle was continuing. But this is why we've come up with the classic idioms like the apple doesn't fall far from the tree or like father, like son. But I want you to understand that these sayings are true for better or for worse. It's not always a bad thing. And this doesn't just pertain to parenthood either. You all have influence on other people around you with your behaviors, your actions, and your words. And those people that you've influenced have influence on the people around them. One generation influences another and another, and the cycle goes on and on and on to the third and to the fourth. Which brings us to the next point. God's grace is greater than generational sin. Another way to look at this is that your influence, bad or good, has effects to those third, that third or fourth generation. But really notice those words, bad or good, meaning we really do have a choice in what we pass on. We have a choice in what our cycle will look like in the future. Ezekiel 18.14 says, Now suppose this man fathers a son who sees all the sins that his father has done. He sees and does not do likewise. 
Our past impacts our present, sure. But it's our present that influences our future and our children's futures and their children's futures. Children are not doomed by their circumstances, but it takes a lot of work. It takes someone teaching them diligently. It takes loving God with all of your heart, soul, and might so that they might do the same. Ezekiel 18.20 says, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Well, that's a little bit more comforting, right? And then Craig Rochelle says this, you can look at a problem as a problem, or you can look at a problem as an opportunity. So what do you do now so that you can course correct? What do you do now so you could change the path of your present or future cycles? Well, let's talk about that. Um, first thing, prioritize God in your family. It's so important to carve out time for God and family in your daily life, but it's also so much more than that. And since I'm apparently into definitions today, I looked at the definition of the word prioritize as well, and I came up with this. To designate or treat something as more important than other things. Now, a lot of us are good at finding some time for God. I mean, you are all here right now, so that's definitely a good start. But to designate and treat God as if he is more important than other things, which he is, by the way, that's where it becomes a little bit tricky for some of us. We tend to want God's blessings without concentrating on living only for God's kingdom. Just like we want to have a great family without emphasizing and practicing the values that families consist of, like unconditional love for each other, unlimited self-sacrifice, lifelong commitment and fidelity through all the changes of life, the giving of time and attention to family instead of oneself, and so much more. But these nice benefits that you get from God and family, they don't occur accidentally. They are achieved only if someone concentrates them or dedicates their lives to making it happen. That's what it means to prioritize. That's what it means to be all in and intentional. You know, there was a story on ESPN about a year ago about a 16-year-old Jewish kid. His name was Oliver Ferber. He was a runner for his school's track team. They went to the state championship even, but Oliver had to tell his teammates that he couldn't run, which they all knew would hurt their chances of winning. Now, Oliver wasn't injured or anything like that. He made the decision himself to not run because it took place on Shabbat which is the Hebrew word for Sabbath, a day of sanctity, simplicity, and rest. Now, nobody was forcing him or telling him to make that decision. He began to take the Sabbath more seriously just a year before that and felt that it was necessary to keep that day holy and to stay connected to God. He prioritized God over sports that day. And I'm sure it was a very difficult decision for him with it being the state championship and what was on the line and how important that, all, that was for his teammates. You don't necessarily have to do that right now. But a change that you can most definitely make right now, today, in order to start prioritizing God is to spend more time with him, to spend more time in prayer. And remember, your kids will imitate you. So what do you want to model for them? Tyler Staten in his book, Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools, said this, Even in a very busy and very distracted world, people still make time for what really matters to them, like eating or sleeping. So there's something deeper beneath the surface that keeps us from spending time in prayer. We have to stop using the excuse of, I don't have time to add prayer or other spiritual practices to my plate right now, or to teach my children diligently, or to dive deeper in God's word, because in reality, You don't have time not to. James 4.13 says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such town and spend a year there. Carry out business and make a profit. Yet you don't know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for just a little time and then vanishes. And parenting is such a short and sweet season. Don't waste it. Jared Lopes in the book, Dad Tired and Loving It, says this, if we aren't careful, we can start to convince ourselves that we have plenty of time to figure out this whole family spiritual leadership thing. We mistakenly think that we will have forever to influence our children. But just think about how quickly this last year went by. Think about how fast your kids are growing up or how long you've already been married. 
And there's nothing in this world more important than loving God and dedicating ourselves to, to his cause. No job, no sport, no financial opportunity, no achievement, no romantic endeavor, nothing. Also, in order to break the cycle of these generational sin patterns, you have to start prioritizing your family. One of the most important purposes of the family is to raise a godly heritage, to fill the earth with spirit-filled, emotionally sound, morally mature, God-worshipping young people who then will in turn do the same when they become parents. Those are the reasons that we get married. Those are the reasons that we become a family. So what are we doing? Why are we falling short? And I think that one of the biggest hurdles here is that we struggle to be present. We get so focused on our future and what tomorrow may bring that we sometimes just miss out on what's right in front of us. A friend of mine recently shared this take on a, his take on a verse that came up in his daily devotional, and that was Matthew 6.34. Do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Guys, God wants us to be fully present right here, right now, to see what's right in front of our eyes. God is working in this very moment, but you'll miss it if you take on tomorrow's worries too. Just like if you spend too much time worrying about the future of your children, you will miss them actually being children. One of the reasons that we really struggle to be present, though, is simply by distraction. And with today's technology, it's so much harder to avoid distraction than probably any other point in human history. Have you ever had your kid or a kid say your name like four or five times before you finally gave them your attention? Guys, your presence is a gift to your family. In fact, have you ever heard of the word fubbing, otherwise known as phone snubbing? Apparently, this is the act of ignoring someone, intentionally or not, in favor of paying attention to your phone instead. And we've likely all done this. Some of you might be doing it to me right now. Um... But there are studies that show that the experience of being phone snubbed by your parent has an extremely similar emotional effect to interacting with a parent who is drunk or inebriated. Because we see them physically there in front of us, but they're not fully mentally there. And this has a devastating effect on how a child feels. They aren't having the real interaction that they think they're having. And think about how much time with your kids and your family that you're just losing here. First off, by the time your kid reaches 12 years old, you will have, on average, spent 75% of the time you will ever spend with them in their lives. 75%. By the time they're, that they are 18, it's 90%. So why are we wasting a single second? I mean, think about it. If your kid was 16 today and you knew you had the equivalent of just 30 full days with them, which is true, wouldn't you be begging for another hour, for another day? But we're faced with that decision every day by making just little decisions to not spend time on your phone around them. If you put your phone away for just 30 more minutes every day around your kids, you would almost double your quality time spent with them overall. How powerful is that? But when prioritizing family, it's also really important to do things such as set family values, establish consistent spiritual and relational household habits, and create intentional family rhythms. It will all impact you and your kids and your family as a whole. James is going to be getting, uh, sharing more into that in just a couple of weeks, but I did want to share a quick story to help show how impactful this really is. There was a young teen at GSM a few, couple months ago who was asked why she reads the Bible the first thing in the morning each day. Like, where did that come from? And she said she didn't always do that and wasn't necessarily told to, but when she wakes up each day and goes out of her room, she sees her parents sitting there reading the Bible together, which led her to feel like this was something important. So now this has become part of her daily routine. And how awesome is that? Our actions, our routines, our habits, they influence others whether we intend them to or not. Now the third thing that can help us break our generational sin cycles is to serve the Lord. Now, you might be thinking, I understand that it's important to serve the Lord, but what does this have to do with breaking generational sin? Well, it's because we are always serving somebody or something. So if we aren't serving the Lord with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our might, what are you serving instead? Maybe it's money or greed or escape or infidelity, anxiety, addiction, control, gossip, power, or other selfish desires of the flesh. 
Joshua 24, 15 says, But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. In these words, we see the will of God plainly laid out for us and our families. We are to serve the Lord and do our part to make sure that our family follows and does the same. But what a prolific statement that was for Joshua to make. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. He isn't saying, as for me, I will serve the Lord and I just hope my family follows. And he also isn't saying, my family will serve the Lord and I'll continue on in my selfish ways. He is confidently stating that he and everyone in his household, which at that time would be his wife, his kids, his grandkids, and even his servants, that they will all serve the Lord. Now he's able to speak this so confidently because he had taught them well for many years. He taught them about God, about God's commands and his goodness. He did so diligently, thoroughly, carefully, exhaustively, persistently, passionately, nonstop. He did it when they sat in the house and when they walked by the way and when they went to bed and when they woke up, just like Deuteronomy 6 tells us to do. Guys, your children need more than someone who will just read the latest devotional to them a couple times a week or that will pray with them at dinner or will listen to worship music with them. And all of those things are great. But your children need parents who are committed to serving the Lord in all aspects of their life. Parents who are helping them apply scriptural truths in everyday life. Parents who live out God's commands themselves. They need to be taught the word while they are sitting and walking and eating and playing. While they laugh, when they cry, when they're scared, when they're mad, when they mess up. When you mess up. Raising children who fall in love with Jesus involves a lot of studying God's word together. Sure, but it also involves just a bunch of 30-second reminders of who God is, of what he is doing, of what, how their current circumstances allow them to live out what they are learning in God's word. Can we guarantee that our children and grandchildren and so forth will follow in our steps and worship the same God that we do? No, because God has given us this unique and beautiful ability to make our own choices. But what we can do is create an environment of godliness and joy that just tips the scales a little bit and makes it that much harder for our kids to choose another path or the ways of this world. So what's it going to be? Going back to John's message last week, what decision is your family going to make today to change? To be a family on mission? To love God together with all of your heart, soul, and might? To be intentional and to pray together? to encourage each other and lift each other up when one of you falls short, to be present with each other for just 30 extra minutes each day, to say yes to breaking generational sin cycles in your life and to be a house that will serve the Lord. What will it be? After worship, um, we'll be up here up front to pray for you or to answer any questions you may have. But will you guys pray with me? God, Father, there is nothing in this world more important than you. I pray that you will, we will become more intentional. We'll find more time to spend with you. Our families are so important, but without you guiding and leading us and loving us and caring for us, who are we? I pray that we take the steps forward to breaking the generational sin cycles in our lives and become households that serve you, Lord. May you lead us to diligently teach our families about you, about your commands and your goodness all the time, exhaustively, carefully, intensely, nonstop. We love you. And it's your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and continue in worship this morning. Yeah. 
darkest night, you can light it up, you can light it up, oh God of revival, let hope arise, death is overcome, you've already won, oh God of revival.
darkest night, you can light it up, you can light it up, oh God, I'm revival, let over eyes, death is overcome, you've already won. for your goodness, God. Bring revival in our families, Lord. Bring revival in our city, God. We thank you, Lord, for the words Tyler gave today. I pray they wouldn't just be heard, but, Lord, that they would sink into our hearts and minds, Lord Jesus. Help us remember this week, Lord, that we serve a God of revival. We serve a God that can make old things new. We serve a God that can turn mourning to dancing and give beauty for ashes and shame into glory. And so, Lord, help us remember that going from this place today. Lord, bring revival in our city. Bring revival in our nation. God, we need you. And so it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We love you guys. We'll see you next week. God bless you. See you next Sunday.